Well, good evening, and thanks for joining us tonight for the first in what will be four uh, Tewksbury Author Spotlights. Uh, Tewksbury has got some great writing talent. Uh, tonight, we're going to listen to a diverse panel of Tewksbury authors as they discuss their works. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for aspiring writers uh, seeking practical advice and inspiration, as well as local readers hoping to discover and connect with local authors. Uh, and our three authors tonight are Stephanie Callan, Robert McDougall, and Kara Wade. Uh, Kara will speak first, followed by Robert, followed by Stephanie, and then uh, we will do audience questions and answers. Uh, so a little bit about Kara first. Uh, Kara is going to uh, discuss uh, some of her steamy romances. Uh, the tagline for some of her books are modern fairy tales made naughty. Uh, and some of her books include Sugar and Spice, uh, as well as a series uh, called Hollywood Lust. So uh, all of us here on the line, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Kara for joining us here tonight. And Kara, the floor is yours for the next 15 minutes or so. Take it away. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kara Wade. Um, I am a local author. I've lived here in Tuxbury for the past five years. Um, two years ago, I actually came and did the live that we did at the at the uh, library, which was wonderful. And so I got to meet a lot of the residents, which was um, awesome. Um, as Robert said, I do have a couple of books that you can actually find in the library. The first one is Sugar and Spice that he mentioned. Um, it is all of my books are contemporary romance. This one is just kind of like the title Sugar and Spice. So it's sweet, but of course, there's a little spice to it. Um, the next book series that he actually mentioned is the Hollywood Lust series. So it's a series of three books. It's the Publicist, the Playboy, and the Starlet. Again, contemporary romance. So there's a whole love storyline. Of course, there's some steamy bits as well. Um, all three of these, I believe, are actually in the library. I think the last one that I needed to give you, Robert, I gave you that day, which was uh, the Starlet. So these four are actually all available at the Tuxbury Library. So if if romance is your jam, uh, you can definitely go ahead and pick these up. Um, a little bit about me before I get into some of my other books, since these ones are um, a few years old, like I said, they're already at the library. Uh, so I got my start in 2018. I published my first book, which was Sugar and Spice. And um, before that, I actually started writing Marvel fan fiction. And so um, I'm, I'm a big Captain America fan. I mean, who doesn't love Chris Evans, right? <laughs> um, and so I actually started off on Tumblr doing fan fiction. So I would write stories about Captain America and, and the Winter Soldier and Thor and, you know, Iron Man. And so like all of the Marvel characters. And so obviously, because I'm a romance author, there was always a romantic spin on it. Um, and it was, I would write what was called reader inserts. So essentially you get to pretend that you're in the story with all of these people. Um, so it, it was it was a lot of fun for me. It was, it was definitely a learning experience. I learned things I should do and things I should not do. And then when I decided that I wanted to actually write my own books and create my own characters in my own worlds, um, I, I actually sought out some help from my friend, um, Michelle Windsor, who is another somewhat local author. She actually lives up um, a little bit north of here, but she is still in the state of Massachusetts. And so I asked her, I was like, all right, you have all these books out and they're amazing and I love your work. And so how do I do this? And so she was really, really great. And she kind of walked me through how to, how to do everything from finding a cover designer to finding an editor and writing a story that obviously, you know, makes sense because you still want people to enjoy the story. Like you're not writing just to write. Um, you are trying to tell a story and with romance, of course, you're telling the story of, you know, usually a hero and a, her and a heroine and, you know, it's kind of just like a little, a little portion of their life that you see in this book. Um, and so she really kind of helped me wrap everything up nicely in a pretty little bow um, and then get published through Amazon. So I feel like most, um, most indie authors are uh, through Amazon. It's because it's one of the easiest places to publish through. Um, they have a nice little step-by-step -step that you can go through, but it doesn't mean that it's any less easy to actually publish a book because, again, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, so I got these first four books written in 2019 and then, uh, or I'm sorry, 2018 and into 19. 
And then I started kind of expanding out. Um, so I have another series here. Robert, I'll have to get you all these books, by the way. Um, so I have another series. Um, so if you guys are into uh, cowboys at all, I do have a, it's a new adult cowboy series. So um, it's the, the Black Stallion Ranch series. So infatuated and enamored. And the books take place 10 years apart from one another, but it follows the same couple, Tristan, Tristan and Lana. Um, probably one of my favorite series that I've written. And I mean, I'm, a, I'm biased, right? I wrote the books anyway, <laughs> but the characters are really great. Um, they're a lot of fun and, and they start off, um, they are younger, they're 18 when, it, when the book starts out. And so then 10 years later in the second book, they are about 28. Um, so it's, it's a lot of first for them and it's new love and, you know, a lot of exploration and it's contemporary romance. So again, there is a little bit of steam in there. Um, and definitely the second book is steamier than the first book, but, um, this, this series I pushed out so fast. I loved it. I love the characters. I definitely think that if you enjoy contemporary romance, especially if you like cowboys, um, these are definitely a great series for you. And then um, I have a couple other books that I've written that are series books. Um, and so what it is, is I've written them with other authors. Um, the, the, first, the first one that I did is High Rise Secrets. It's actually book number three in the Sin and Secrets series. I wrote this with three other uh, indie authors. And so we actually all met through Instagram. Um, we're all across the United States. One is in Kentucky, one is Georgia, and the other one's Tennessee. So really, I'm the only Yankee out of all of us, but that's fine. Um, and we got together one night after a random conversation that we were having and came up with the whole premise of this. So this book, um, it is book number three in the series. You do not have to read the other three, the other two books before it. Um, for it to make sense. You can read it on your own as a standalone. So Robert, I will definitely get you this book. Um, but if you guys want to start out on Amazon, I do actually have a prequel novella, which all four of us girls wrote. And it's a background to the four main characters of this book series. That's actually for free and you can get that on Amazon. And I can always send you the links so then you can put it up in comments, Robert. Um, and then the other book that I wrote, and this one actually came out this year, it's part of the Falls Village collection. Um, that was written with eight other authors. Most of them are in Connecticut. Um, again, I'm kind of oddball out in Massachusetts, but that's fine. Um, and so my book for that series is My New Forever. This is, this is probably everyone's favorite book that I've heard from. Um, it follows a single dad and who doesn't love single dad stories. But the problem is, obviously his wife passes away but he can't connect with his daughter and so it's it's a love story of him meeting Hannah um and falling in love with her but how he also can connect with his kids again um so it's really heartwarming she's the sassy little girl um everybody loves her her name's Amber and she is just a spitfire for a three-year-old um but this collection was a lot of fun to write too like I said there's eight other authors there's 14 books in total all of my books are on Amazon through Kindle Unlimited. So if you guys are subscribed, um, I will get Robert all of my books. And then if you want to check them out at the library, please, please, please do. I'd love to hear from you. Um, I would love to know what you think. Um, and I have nine in total. So there's a lot of, lot of books for you guys to read if you do enjoy romance. And I really hope that you guys check it out. Thanks so much. I really appreciate you guys spending the time with us tonight. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kara. And I will absolutely take you up on your offer to donate any books that you've written uh, to the <clears> library. <throat> uh, in the chat, I did um, link to the um, four or five that we already own. Um, so those are um, on that uh, in that list that I've linked in the in the chat. So folks can check those out. All right. So uh, next up on the agenda here is uh, <clears throat> Robert McDougall. Uh, or should I call him Mr. McDougal or Coach McDougal? I'm not <laughs> sure. But um, so uh, Bob McDougal is a retired uh, longtime Tewksbury High School history teacher and track coach. Uh, and he's here tonight to discuss uh, some of his uh, nonfiction American history books, uh, including, um, uh, I think his favorite, uh, my, my favorite title of his is American History. It's more than the crap you learned in high school. 
Uh, so uh, for all of us on the line, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Mr. McDougall for joining us here tonight. <clears throat> and Bob, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, if you were uh, intrigued and uh, interested uh, in Kara's books, then you're probably dreading what I'm about to say. <laughs> Uh, but that's how I was in high school. Uh, when I was a junior in high school, I saw American history as just another class to take. Uh, all the names, dates, battles. To me, they were all meaningless abstractions, things to memorize for a test, right? But then in a small section of the history textbook called Up Close and Personal, I read the story of the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. Well, here was a man who grew up in Newburyport and never saw an enslaved black person until he was 18. And yet when he heard the plight of the wretched and abused slaves in the South, he quickly decided to make it his career to fight to set them free. And after 35 years of intense struggle, he lived to see the success of his life's work. Well, Garrison's story fascinated me. At 18, I had never met a person of color believe it or not, never even met one, and was impressed that a young man with a background similar to mine had taken up the cause of the enslaved people and had dedicated his life to securing their freedom. I was so smitten by the Garrison story that I wanted to learn more about slavery, about the abolitionist movement, about the Civil War, and also about the man who crowned the abolitionist efforts with success, and that would be Abraham Lincoln. The dramatic story of the emancipation of the enslaved black people became my on-ramp to a love for American history. I now realize history was a study of people, not just a list of battles and dates. I decided to make a career of studying American history, teaching it to high school students, and writing books about it if I could, starting with the story of who else? William Lloyd Garrison. Well, amidst my teaching responsibilities, mostly at Tewksbury High School, I finally found time to publish my first book, The Agitator and the Politician. William Lloyd Garrison, Abraham Lincoln, and the Emancipation of the Slaves. See, realizing that Garrison would never have won freedom for the slaves without the political skills of Abraham Lincoln, I wrote a dual biography telling the fascinating story of how the two very different men ultimately brought about the most significant change in American history. The thesis I developed in my book is that Garrison and his allies, the radical abolitionists, kept up a constant clamor for the very drastic change of setting all of the slaves free immediately. They demanded that no payments be made to the slave owners for their loss of property and that no attempt should be made to ship the freed people of color to Africa or some other distant place. Well, these demands sparked furious responses from the slave owners who demanded that Garrison be silenced, even killed. Meanwhile, more moderate people who thought slavery was wrong but could not support immediate emancipation, people such as Abraham Lincoln, slowly began to gravitate towards the abolitionist views. The result of all this tension and turmoil was the Civil War, during which President Lincoln finally took the drastic step he had long resisted, the abolished slavery in the United States. Now, people who have read my book have responded enthusiastically, commenting that they had never before understood how slavery was abolished until they read it. But at a time now when racial issues are disrupting the nation more than ever, the book lends important background to the issues that are roiling the country today. I'm very proud of this book and especially the second edition of it, the one I'm holding here, uh, it came out just last year. It amplifies my thesis and includes pictures and maps to assist the reader's understanding. Uh, Robert, I think you may have my first edition of this book, but not this one. I have also written uh, three other history books, Leaders in Dangerous Times. This book compares the careers and leadership styles of two men who were central figures in the 20th century, Douglas MacArthur and Dwight D. Eisenhower. While comparing and contrasting the leadership style of the two generals, I take readers through several major events of the past century, 
World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and the Cold War. Both generals had great success in their own areas, Eisenhower in Europe, MacArthur in Asia, but their decision-making and leadership strategies were very different. Readers are encouraged to make their own judgments about the strengths and weaknesses of each man. In the process, readers gain a better understanding of the history of American policy between 1900 and 1960. Uh, then there's uh, American history. It's more than the crap you learned in high school, as Robert uh, remarked. This is an attempt to answer Paul Simon's famous indictment of American education and prove to people that history is not the crap you learn in high school and that knowledge of the subject helps you live your life in many practical ways. Since this book came out in 2016, people have told me that it has entertained them and served as a great review book for them and a motivator for high school students that they know. And finally, there's rants, raves, and reflections of an American historian, that would be me. It's a compilation of 60 essays about history and the politics of today. There are essays on topics ranging from little known but important historical figures, my opinions about the statues and monuments controversies, and my views on Donald Trump and the place he may occupy in the history books of the future. Each essay is entertaining and takes four pages or less, so it's a good bedside book to read for short-term amusement. I've given many talks about my books, particularly The Agitator and the Politician, in several venues, most recently at senior centers in Andover, Melrose, and Winchester, and at Central Catholic High School in Lawrence during Black Awareness Month. I find it very stimulating to describe history in a clear and concise style to interesting audiences, interested audiences and to debate controversial subjects raised by history, such as the role of civil disobedience in a democratic society and how we deal with racism when we talk about history. Anybody who would like to purchase any of my books or discuss an appearance by me at your senior center, library, school, or book group, you can reach me at rmcdougall66 at gmail.com. There it is. So Bob, thank you so much. Uh, I, I also just typed your email address into the chat for anyone who may have missed the oh, assignment. Great, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, as always, Bob, really appreciate it. Very thorough. Thanks for uh, thanks for the uh, the overview of your books. Um, all right, and I'll have to get the second edition of uh, of the first book you spoke of. Um, bring it right over. So, all right, I appreciate that. All right, so next up is um, Stephanie. So Stephanie Callen is with us tonight, and she'll be discussing her debut uh, teen fantasy steampunk novel. Uh, entitled The Debt. And so Stephanie, you'll have to tell us what steampunk means. As a librarian, I know what it means, but there may be folks in the audience who, who do not. Uh, so everyone who's here virtually with us, let's give Stephanie a big virtual round of applause for joining us here tonight. And Stephanie, wow. the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to say um, thank you to Robert and the Tuxbury Library for inviting me back this year. It was very, awesome um and what robert brought up earlier steampunk it is um sorry <laughs> um so steampunk is basically kind of a genre amongst um the more nerdier crowd of basically looking at alternate victorian history i guess um like what if things had more gears and cogs and there were more blimps um <laughs> So it, it's something you, it's mostly an aesthetic. It's something you might probably have seen without knowing that you saw it. So anyway, on to, um, on to my book. I wrote a novel called The Debt. And um, <clears throat> like Robert said, it is a steampunk fantasy YA novel. And it follows, it is set in an alternate Boston and follows Nora, who is a painfully shy 13 year old girl as she is forced to pay off the debts of her deceased father and confront his dark secrets. Um, I also have a couple of other works in progress right now, like a, such as a sequel to The Debt 
and an unrelated, completely unrelated novel um, that's probably going to come out before the sequel, if I'm going to be honest. Um, that one is also a fantasy that I'm gearing towards adults. So <clears throat> one of the things that I did when I wrote The Debt was I wanted to make a character that was different from other protagonists that you usually see in teen and children's uh, adventure stories. So those protagonists are typically, um, they're typically very rebellious, very adventurous, very stick it to the man. You tell them not to push the button and then they're absolutely going to push that button. And, um, and that's fine. You need, like, you need those characters. You need those stories. It's fantastic. But that's not the type of kid that I was when I was that age. And when I was that age, I kind of wanted to see more stories with kids like me who were incredibly shy and awkward and terrified of talking to other people. So that's where I came up with the idea for my main character, Nora. She is all of what I just said above. She is not comfortable talking to people at all. And she is this, and basically what I'm making with the series is I'm just attempting to kind of make a journey of her getting confident while also doing fancy magic stuff. Um, there, a couple of other characters also include an incredibly snarky and sarcastic fire spirit named Vestin. He's basically, he's basically the source of 90% of my jokes. A lot of fun. And she is also joined by her friend Oliver, who can be unpleasant, but I'm working on it. <laughs> um, so, hmm. And that's basically what I have for now. So thank you all very much for listening to me talk. And thank you again to Robert and Library and the other um, Karen, Robert, you guys are awesome. So thank you. Well, thank you, Stephanie. So at this time, if anyone has any questions or comments for our authors, uh, you can type them into the chat or the Q&A and I will uh, relay those to them. Uh, I did want to start though. I, we have at least, a, and I'm terrible with names, but I think we have at least two folks with us who are part of the library's writing group. Uh, the library has a writing group that meets once a month, uh, typically on a Tuesday night, although we're going to be meeting on Monday nights for the next couple of months. Um, it's uh, facilitated by um, a published author named Dale Phillips. He's, uh, he, I think he's written over 70 short stories and he's published uh, more than a dozen novels. Um, but anyway, each, uh, each meeting we have a different guest speaker who talks about a different aspect of, 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 uh, of writing. Um, but anyway, we have a couple of those folks in the audience and I wanted to ask you all, um, and we can start with Kara first. Uh, do you have any advice for any aspiring writers, uh, any, any uh, words of wisdom for folks who are thinking about writing and publishing their first novel or their, or their first book? Don't be afraid to tell the story that you want to tell. Um, writing and, and telling a story, it, it's art and art is very subjective and you're not going to please everyone. And unfortunately, there are the trolls out there and the people that aren't going to like your book and are going to tell you in not so nice terms that they don't like your book, but you can't let that get you down. Um, show it to friends, show, show it to people that you trust and get their opinions because you as an author know exactly where you wanna go with this story but your readers may not. And so if you show it to friends and you have peers that are willing to look at it, they may be able to find like plot holes that you never would have caught because in your mind, everything makes perfect sense because you know exactly what's supposed to happen in the characters, but they don't know where you're going with it. They're, they're along for the journey, just like your characters are. So keep writing, don't let the naysayers get you down and show your work to people and get opinions. Great. Thanks, Kara. Uh, Bob, did you want to weigh in? Any advice for aspiring writers? Well, of course, I've, uh, my writing is all um, fact-based. I, I don't get the, I don't have the luxury of creating people out of thin air. On the other hand, that's a, um, that's a burden, too, because you, because um, I have what really happened to go on. Um, my friends here, Stephanie and Kara, they have to make it all up. So uh, that is sort of a two-edged sword, but 
once I get all the material, or in the case of writing fiction, once you have all the things in mind that you want to have in your story, the big problem is how to organize it, how to get it so it, it makes sense and, and, it, and doesn't tell too much at the beginning if you're trying to write some kind of, um, of a mystery. So what I found is very helpful is I put stuff on cards. I actually put the different topics on three by five cards like this. And I uh, put them up on the wall. You know how the police, uh, when you see a crime show, they have all the, the pictures of the different people and they have little uh, pieces of string going from one to the other. I do that with my book because it enables you to see where things are and to move things around easily. Now, you don't have to erase or cut and paste or anything. You just take this card, move it over here. Oh, I think that would go better at the beginning than at the end. And uh, it really helps me visualize. I can stand back, look at the wall, sometimes sit there for a while and think, no, no, I ought to tell that earlier than I did. Um, so that's one of my big pieces of advice because an, a disorganized book, even if it's fiction, is hard to read. You got you to remember that your readers are in trouble most of the time. They're having trouble following you. So you gotta make it for make it easy for them. And one good way to do that is to be super organized. And one good way to be organized is to put it all up on the wall so you can sit back and look at it. Great, thank you, Bob, for that suggestion, that, that, that advice. Uh, Stephanie, did you wanna weigh in as well? Yeah, so mine is kind of picking, backing off of Kara, which is write your story. Um, Definitely take anybody's suggestions and edits to heart. You know, if if they say, hey, you should do A instead of B and A is actually better than B, then do it. But at the end of the day, it's your story. You're writing it for you. You're writing the story that you want to see in the world. So do it. Um, there are <laughs> like, like don't try to write the next Harry Potter because there are a thousand Harry Potters out there already including the actual Harry Potter, right? <laughs> write the actual story that you want. And so, Bob, so, uh, so thank you, Stephanie, for that. And um, uh, Bob's, uh, Bob, Bob made me think of a meme that I just uploaded to the, um, to the <laughs> chat there. Um, um, probably most of you won't get the reference, but I'm going to, I'm going to put it there anyway. Uh, so, uh, next question goes to me and, uh, Stephanie already, already, um, answered it in, in her presentation, uh, piece, but I'm curious, uh, Kara and Bob, uh, what, what are you working on currently? Uh, what, what's coming up next for you? Oh gosh. Um, okay. So very slow writing. Um, like I told you, Robert, I, I have a baby at home, so he takes up most of my time right now. However, um, I have plotted out a series of five books. Um, so they're all standalone. So they follow different couples, but all of them are friends. And so you see the characters kind of interconnected throughout. Um, it is a very slow going process this time, unlike my other books. Um, but yeah, so I, I have a series of five books that I'm working on right now. Um, the Boston Babes collection is currently the name of the collection I'm going with, but that very well may change by the time it comes out. <laughs> Excellent, thanks Kara for sharing. And Bob, are you working on a, a history book at the moment? <clears throat> uh, well, it's kind of a history book. It's a history of myself. <laughs> oh. I'm uh, writing a, um, a memoir because all of the time during this COVID, you know, it felt like you're kind of stuck in the house. So I found it uh, comforting uh, and kind of fun to just go back in my life. And um, I, I'm, I'm not doing it from the cradle to the grave kind of thing, uh, chronologically. I'm just doing little vignettes of things from my life that I remember. It's gonna be pretty limited in publication. It's just gonna be for my family mostly. Sure. And I'm not even sure I'll have it published while I'm still alive. Because <laughs> there may be some things in there that I'd rather I wasn't around to watch people read. Um, but I try to make it humorous. I try to uh, have a light touch to it. It's got chapters like, um, or it's got a little article, little vignettes, like um, I was lucky to get out of the 60s alive, uh, <clears throat> things like that. So um, yeah, so I've been having fun doing that. I've written about 400 pages 
So I'm going to have, but of course, for this, the history books, I always had trouble finding pictures that I could use. Uh, for this, I have plenty of pictures I can use because they're all mine. <laughs> so I don't have to get permission from anybody. Um, so that's kind of what I've been doing. But I've also been trying to prepare uh, presentations of the books that I have written uh, because I'm hoping someday this COVID thing will lighten up a little more and uh, I can get out and talk to senior centers, uh, book groups. Um, I had really enjoyed going to Central Catholic during their Black Awareness Month mm -hmm. and talking about the agitator and the politician. Uh, they had some great questions to ask me, particularly about the new um, uh, Black history approach, the 1619 project, mm -hmm. and, uh, and also uh, critical race theory. So it's had some interesting discussions about that drawing from my book. So uh, I'm preparing talks about my books that I've already written and I'm writing my memoir. Very, very cool. Personal. Yes, yeah, Bob, that's great. That's great. Uh, sounds like it's going to be a tell all. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> not but, all. Uh, but good for you. Bob, did you keep a journal uh, or are you, or is this all just recall? Are, are these, uh, did, you, did you keep a diary or a journal uh, throughout your life or are you just trying <clears> to remember things? I'm a little bit OCD. I have 50 little diaries uh -huh. that go back to the day Diane and I got married. Oh. 51 years ago and so every night before I go to bed I write what happened that day not much just a, yeah. a short page so if you ask me what did you do on January 10th 1985 I can tell you <laughs> I just go to, I just go to the 1985 book and look it up yeah so well, that has been some help yes I would imagine very valuable tools <laughs> when you're writing a memoir that's great you know, sometimes it's surprising to find out what really happened. When you, it differs from your memory. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Exactly. I'm sure. Uh, all right. We do have uh, three audience questions so far, and I encourage folks to, to get them on in. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, uh, what do you do when you have writer's block? So who would like to tackle that question first? Um, I'll tell you what I do. Um, so writer's block happens pretty frequently for me. Um, I'll, I'll go, go, go. And then all of a sudden I've got nothing. Um, sometimes if I just change up the location that I'm writing in, that'll help. And it'll, you know, being in a different environment will kind of spur new things. Um, or a lot of the time I go off the, the thought of if I'm having writer's block, there's something that's not working somewhere. And so I'll actually go back and reread what I've written to make sure that it all makes sense. Um, and I've actually gone back and I, I did that actually with the Playboy. I got about almost halfway through the book and then had to scrap about a quarter of it um, because it, the timeline was all off. It wasn't working. And, and as soon as I fixed that, I mean, it was a lot to, to scrap, but as soon as I got rid of it, the words flew off the page. And so um, for me, a lot of the time is just making sure that the characters are kind of going in the direction that you want them to. Again, from a fiction standpoint, I know, Robert, it'd be a little different <laughs> if you're trying to tackle uh, writer's block than me. <laughs> so Mr. McDougall, did you want to speak on uh, any tips on conquering writer's block? <clears throat> well, for one thing, you, you got to be ready to trash stuff you wrote because it's no good. I always remember the story of Mark Twain. He had 400 pages of a manuscript, looked at it one day and said, this is junk. And he threw it in the wastebasket, started all over again. The book was Huckleberry Finn. So uh, yeah, you gotta be willing to uh, say, uh, you know, all that, I don't wanna just use all that just cause it was a lot of work. It's junk, I'm throwing it away. Um, so you gotta be willing to scrap stuff but by the same token, you got to be willing to just plunge in and just start writing stuff. And it may end up being crap, but it actually may end up being pretty good. So uh, sometimes I just start doodling. I just start writing whatever I feel like. And uh, all of a sudden you get on the track, so to speak, and, uh, and away you go. So I find an environment where there's a lot of distractions is actually my best place to write. I go to the lo local coffee shop and I, I'm there with people walking in and going around and everything everything and for some reason I can focus better and write in that environment better than sitting alone at my desk. 
Very interesting. Well, I don't know if that would work for other people, but I like it. Oh, interesting. Uh, and then Stephanie, did you have any uh, tips you wanted to offer regarding writer's block? Um, just slog through it. That's basically what I do. I cry and I slog through it. That's a lie. No, just, uh, just slog through it. Um, and just keep in mind, just you can always go back and edit. You can always go back on your second draft and change things that you don't like or change word, phrasing or wording. It's, it doesn't have to stay that way. Just do what you can, basically, until it's done. Great. Thank you all for the, uh, the answers there. Uh, Teresa has a question uh, specifically for Kara. Uh, Teresa asks, uh, Kara, what was it like to write books with other authors? What are some of the pros and what are some of the cons? Uh, challenging. It was very challenging to do. Um, this series, the, the Falls Village series was actually, this one was relatively easy the characters that I was writing about, they were already pre-established characters from another author's, like another series that she wrote. Um, and so it was pretty much just me putting a spin on it. This one was, this one was easy. I pulled in characters from a couple of other books, but overall I would just reach out to the authors and be like, hey, I have a part with your character in it. Can you just read it and let me, you know, let me know if I need to change the way they're talking or anything like that, or if everything kind of flows. Um, so overall Falls Village, that one was great. And that was actually the second uh, collaboration that I did. This first one for Sin and Secrets was extremely challenging. Um, the way that this series works is where one book ends, the next book picks up. And we were all writing at the same time. So no, nobody really knew exactly how their books were going to end. And so it was just kind of like a challenge. They're like, well, I think it's going to kind of end this way. So why don't you start your book kind of around that time frame? And then you kind of had to build off that. And then they would write more. So then you would have to add stuff into the book um, just to make sure that, you know, everything kind of flows. And of course, the three other authors read my book. They went through and they gave their, their um, opinions and stuff like that. Um, the other challenging thing is I actually create my own, I design my own covers um, and so I designed the covers for that series. And so trying to get three other women to all agree <laughs> on similar covers, right? Because you, you want the, you want the synergy between all the books. And so all of the books have masks on them. They're all different masks. They're all different colors. You know, the, the font down at the bottom is a different color and stuff, and it all kind of works, but it was very challenging because everybody has very different opinions on how they feel the book cover should look. But ultimately, I need them to all kind of look the same. Um, and so there was a lot of back and forth. Um, some decisions were made that I wasn't super happy with. Some de decisions were made that others weren't super happy with. And so it's, it's really a give and take. Um, but the writing part of it was definitely very challenging, just because again, we're all writing our books at the same time. And we had chats going constantly, but you know, if if one character appeared more in my book than others, I had to work closer with that other author. Um, and so it's it was a it was a learning experience. Um, I I would do it again. I think that if I did it again, um, we would just need to plan out a little bit more. Maybe do what what Robert's done and uh, you know he had the board going and stuff I, I think that we need to kind of do that same type of thing where we all have a board going and really like the story's just planned out from start to finish that way it makes it a little bit easier for the other authors. Uh, thank you Kara. Uh, next question is for all the authors. Um, uh, this is also from Teresa. She wants to know, did you take um, any writing classes? Did you join any writers groups? or did you just jump in and start writing? Uh, and Bob, why don't we go to you first? Well, I was fortunate enough, uh, fortunate enough at the University of Michigan where I went to college to have some very good uh, professors who were real sticklers for how you wrote. Uh, they demanded uh, good grammar, concise explanation of things. Um, I had one professor in particular who was uh, really demanding in that way. 
So I felt by the time I had graduated from that school, I was, I had some of the basic tools. It was just a matter of keep on practicing them. Um, they also took a lot of English courses there and, uh, and also methods of teaching English, which along with history, I taught English as well in high school. So uh, I feel like I've had that uh, uh, in formal ways. I've never actually taken a class in writing for publication though. Great, thanks uh, Bob. Uh, Stephanie, how about yourself? Do you ever take any writing classes or join a writing group or did you just kind of jump in? Yes to all three. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I started writing as a kid. It was just kind of one of my outlets and something I always knew I wanted to do. So once, um, whenever an opportunity arose, like in high school, I took writing classes. Once I was in college, I majored in English, took every writing course that was available. And even recently, um, I joined a writer's group and the feedback on all of those is amazing that you can get, like, especially with the writer's group. Um, it's just getting that kind of feedback is definitely something that you would need, as, um, especially if you're planning on uh, sharing and editing your book. And, and Kara, did you want to weigh in on this question as well? Yeah, I just kind of jumped in and I wing it. <laughs> I'd be an editor to help me make sure that like it all sounds good. But for the most part, I just I jumped in. Um, I've met a lot of friends along the way through Facebook and through Instagram and stuff. And so I'll, I'll converse with them, but other than that, nothing formal. All right. Um, so uh, let me ask the last question and unless someone sneaks one in on me, but um, so how can uh, the live viewers uh, plus the viewers who will be watching on demand, um, how can they learn more about uh, each of you? And so Kara, and I know you have a, you just referenced it, you have a, uh, uh, a large social media following, but, but how, can, uh, how can folks uh, get a hold of you and learn more about your books and maybe buy your books? Um, so Amazon is always great. Um, I have all of my books up on Amazon available in paperback as well as the Kindle version, and they are available um, through Kindle Unlimited. Um, you can also check out my website, authorkarawade.com. Um, I, it's still in the almost fully up stage because I, I just did a whole revamp of it. Um, but I do actually have paperbacks that are for sale through my website. Uh, so if you wanted like an autograph copy or of course go to the library because Robert's going to have all my books soon instead of just four. Um, so yeah, definitely, you know, multiple ways to get in touch with me and, and to check me out. And, um, you know, I love hearing from people. So anytime you want to reach out, I welcome it. Wonderful, thanks, Kara. Uh, so Bob, uh, and I know you've given us your email address. Uh, how else uh, can people get in touch with you and, and buy your books? Well, I am on Facebook and um, uh, all my books are available on uh, Amazon. Um, but the best way really is to use that um, email address. I will send you a copy um, of any one of the four or all of them <laughs> uh, without charging for shipping. So um, all you have to do is tell me how many, many you want, I'll send them to you and you send me the money. <laughs> uh, send me a check or Venmo or however, however you wanna do it. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty basic, old school. Send well, wait, money, a second, send Bob. Book. <laughs> wait a second, Bob, you say you're old school but you just dropped uh, the fact that you accept Venmo. So I'm impressed by that. Oh yeah, I, well, I had a few people tell me they wanted to buy my book but they only do Venmo. So I. Figured I had to get up to speed. There you go. All right. Uh, and then Stephanie, uh, how, how, how should uh, folks uh, uh, learn more about you and, and buy your book? So my book is available to purchase on Amazon. It's also available um, on barnesandnoble.com and through lulu.com, which is where I publish. Uh, you, can, you can find out more about me. Um, I have my professional Twitter account, which is at Writes. I also have a Facebook page for the debt. It's, let's see, what's the name of it again? It is The Debt, a novel by Stephanie Callen. And you can also try emailing me at sdcallen at gmail.com for if you need more information on anything. But probably the best way to get updates would be through the Twitter, um, the Twitter account, S. Callen Writes. 
Got it. All right. Well, the library will start following your Twitter account tonight if it's not already. Okay. So uh, I want to thank uh, Kara, Bob, and Stephanie for joining us here tonight. I uh, also want to thank uh, our audience members and thank you for the few of you that asked uh, questions, uh, great questions. And uh, I do want to encourage folks to attend our next Tewksbury Author Spotlight panel, which will be on Tuesday, October 5th uh, at seven o'clock. And um, uh, I do have uh, the authors booked, but I am not recalling names, uh, their names at the moment, uh, but I will share those publicly shortly. Uh, but again, uh, three authors, three different genres uh, next, uh, next month on Tuesday, October 5th at seven o'clock via Zoom. So again, thank you, Kara. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you to the audience. Uh, for those here live, uh, look for an email for me tomorrow morning with a link to a feedback survey. Uh, please let me know what you thought of tonight's event and what you'd like to see for future events. And also in that email will be a link to this recording. Uh, and please uh, feel free to share that with anyone in your life who you may feel, who you feel may be interested uh, in tonight's panel. So uh, thank you all and everyone thank have you, a Robert. great night. Yeah, thanks thank Bob, you. thanks Kara. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks everyone. Have a great night. Bye. I'm gonna end the call now. Thanks so much. <laughs>